If you want to better understand yourself and how to better interact with others, you need to understand your values. That's why The Minimalist created a free, downloadable, and printable values worksheet that will help you identify all of your different values and the obstacles that are in your way. Head on over to theminimalists.com V to download your free values worksheet today. Enjoy. The Minimalists. Can the strength of one's immune system be measured? If so, how? And what are, she's asking for a top 10. Let's not necessarily say we have a top 10 list, but what are some daily habits a human can adopt to strengthen his or her immune system? So is there a way to, I mean, how would we measure the immune system? I guess we're looking at inflammation as one way to look at the immune system. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of measures. There's inflammatory measures, there's antibody measures, there's, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can measure for the immune system. So that's that's pretty read- readily quantified, I would yeah. offer. And, and so, so what what tests do you ask your doctor for if you're if you're wanting to measure your immune your immune s- system functionality? Um, you want to look at like um, you want to look at things like secretory IgA or IgA. Um, you want to look at like very key inflammatory markers. You know, nothing too esoteric. Your CRP and um, you know, different measures like that is the first things that I would go for. These are all blood tests, by the way. Yeah, things okay. that you can look at. Yeah. And, and so, what are some daily habits uh, to answer Becky's question here that we can use that we can implement to improve our immune system in the long term? Yeah. Um, sleep and diet are kind of the top two, yeah. really. Uh, mm-hmm. So, diet on a daily basis. Um, there's a pattern that I put forth in the book, which is not meant to be a diet. It's meant to be a solution to a complex grouping of problems, which is the real world circumstance we all live in daily where you get interrupted, you get knocked off course. But then at the same time, we have this need to um, restore things while we sleep. And then we have this need to um, age better and all these things. And that that dietary pattern was my attempt at answering that question the best way that, to my mind, could possibly be done, which was to provide balance in the diet, but at the same time, um, give a nod to sequencing, uh, butyrate production while we sleep, repletion of NAD and very specific things through fasting, but not overly fasting, and then giving the body a break a few times a week from insulin production and activation of all the youth extending pathways like the sirtuins and AMPK. And so through the diet, we have this massive control switch over immunity. Um, and and the things that govern immunity, and we can govern, we can govern the things that compromise immunity. So, example is um, oxidative stress, redox stress from the foods we eat. And one thing people have to realize is that it doesn't matter what you eat; um, it's oxidative by its very nature. So, it's called um, oxidative metabolism. Mm-hmm. The idea that metabolism by its very nature is oxidative. Mm-hmm. There's a cost to eating. And once we understand what that cost is, we can sort of offset that cost by the way we sequence and time foods. So diet is huge, sleep is the other. Um, And then there's kind of a third grouping of things which really fall under replacing things that we've lost. Um, Mm -hmm. One of those example would be just contact with dirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, Like literally like, like if you garden, if your hands get in the soil, there's some really fascinating new research that shows just getting your hands dirty for about 10 minutes a day, um, what happens is you literally get bacterial transmission to the inner organs from the skin because mm-hmm. the skin's one of the body's biggest organs. Right. And so in the soil are tens of thousands of microorganisms, half of which we haven't even quantified yet. Our ancestors were merged with those. Yeah. Yeah. And so by just literally antigen sampling and, and by um, taking in other strains of bacteria, we sort of merge with our environment. Mm-hmm. So you could offer that our ancestors probably had much more robust immune systems than we do because we're so hyper sanitized. In fact, there's some fascinating research that compares the same ethnic populations, one living in Finland where everything's hyper sanitized and hyper clean and you know, the dirt is removed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then in Russia where you have some rural farmers and they're just, they're in the dirt all the time. Uh-huh. And the, the dirty farmers are way healthier. Right. Yeah. Way healthier. Yeah, Bex grew up on, on, a on a farm in Minnesota and yeah. And I, I attribute a lot of her you know, lifelong health to to that. That I mean, she she set herself up. Oh, well, her family uh, set yeah, herself up for. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's fascinating to me that there is this. You know what we've done, especially recently in our current times. Is, and I understand the 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 desire to be safe, but also we're 
so hyper sterile mm-hmm. that we're kind of missing the point. Very much so. Very much. Like um, there, there's such fascinating, interesting research on um, eating dirt and being dirty, mm-hmm. and the beneficial effects of that. Um, so camping, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, there's really good research on farm kids because they grow up in an, in an environment where essentially the microorganisms are nebulized in the air and they're breeding those in mm-hmm. and it affects their immunity. They're healthier wow. because of that. Wow. So there's, there's this category of replacing back things that have been lost. It's the dirt, it's the air, it's the sun. It's all of these sort of like, you know, natural things that we that we've just subtracted by virtue of mechanization and industrialization and COVID and staying indoors. And those things have a massive impact on immunity, massive. And they're easy to replace, like literally just gardening 10 minutes or putting your hands in garden soil is huge. Which is the opposite of what we're doing now. We are every place you turn, there is a hand sanitizer. And I've just heard horror stories of people getting all warts on their hands and all that, because you're disrupting, people think of the the microbiome as though it's something in the gut. We also have one on the skin, right? huge and it's it's uh, the the research on this is so compelling um so when you garden or you get your hands in the dirt and your hands are in the dirt for let's say 10 15 minutes Mm -hmm. and you go and wash your hands off you don't eliminate the bacteria the bacteria persists and then it actually finds its way to your organs and it improves immune function yeah yeah and 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 you can go down the list um another example is just air so we're in this you gotta think about something like with covid today you have this you have this, and this is just, it doesn't matter what your position on this is. It just, I, all I'm saying is if you're in the audience, think this one through a little bit. Um, most people today have issues with sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like you're not getting enough oxygen when you sleep. Okay. That's a cancer promoter. It's like right at the top of the list of cancer promoting. Then um, depending on what you do, you may be spending a good chunk of your day with a mask on. Yeah. Okay. And you're not getting exposed to the air. You're getting exposed to your own, your own breathing out, your own CO2. Um, so you're essentially mimicking sleep apnea. During, sli- during, the, during the day. Uh, there's a thing, um, I have a course where I talk about this. There's a thing called a reoxygenation injury. And I haven't heard this talked about anywhere in the news and I'm, I'm blown away by it. A reoxygenation injury happens when you go from not getting enough oxygen and then suddenly reoxygenate, okay? Huh. What happens is if you look at what happens inside the cell, the cell goes from a state of uh, of stabilized HIF-1 to introducing combustion back in the cell, okay, through oxygenation. Yeah. And essentially inside the cell, it injures the cell. Mm. So you get this prevalence of inflammatory markers and um, uh, free radical production as a result of reoxygenating. So a good example of this would be you wake up in the morning and you're really sore. Yeah. A lot of that, and, and the first half of the day, you're super sore. A lot of that's a reoxygenation injury because you're not getting enough oxygen at night. You wake up, you stop your sleep apnea, and now you're getting this inflammatory storm in the body when you reoxygenate. Mm. So if you're constantly reoxygenating during the day after sustained periods of not having oxygen, you should think that one through. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, let's talk a bit about brain health and it, how it relates to to gut health. I'm I'm thinking about we have. Uh, Actually, we're recording this before the election, but it's going to come out after the election. So this will be fascinating. Oh, my gosh. Uh, really? Yeah. And so, we, you know, this is obviously isn't a political show, but we have two people who are running for president or were running for president at this point who um, they had cognitive decline uh, to be kind. Right. W- one probably worse than the other. And, I, and we, we see this a lot as people age, obviously, the cognitive decline of aging. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's, it seems to me that it's potentially preventable in many instances at least. Um, but it probably starts with the gut, doesn't it? Uh, the gut has a lot. Y- yes but not totally. Um, There is a component um, related from the health of the gut. um, And you can, you can sort of say this is a X percent, you know, contributor to cognitive decline, uh, but it's not everything. Um, Cognitive decline is multifactorial and you see a lot of different um, things that contribute to the buildup of amyloid plaques in the brain and, you know, um, the degradation of, of cognitive function. Um, It is much more amelioratable than probably we believe um, just along the way through different types of protocols. Um, there's, there's even simple things that are available now, like mushrooms mm. that have been shown to help, you know, with cognitive decline. So, um, 
as much as we is you know being a gut guy as much as i would like to say it's all the gut it's not <laughs> right no but but i i have noticed that a lot of people when they start to make those changes and they go with one of these sort of experimental diets the elimination diets uh one thing that people often report myself included is more mental clarity mm -hmm. less brain fog mm -hmm. so there seems to be some sort of correlation there right mm -hmm. can, can we talk about why why that is why why might the food that we eat cause us to have brain fog well um as we age there's a there's a very good argument that alzheimer's is the third form of diabetes mm -hmm. okay oh wow that really what it is is it's a problem of glucose transport in the brain and the way the brain is using sugar is basically impaired so and, and think of it like you know what if what if you know you had s like central obesity what if you had that in the brain and the brain just didn't use sugar the way it was supposed to. Then what you would find is that when you shift inputs and substrates of things, and then the brain begins burning ketones, it's like the lights go back on. Yeah. Like, hey, suddenly things are working. Well, it's because you've got um, a dual drive system that powers the car and the gas engine system's not working very well. Um, and then what you find is when you shift to the electric drive, things seem to go better. Sure. Okay, So that's, that's partially an answer for it. Um, the other answer has to do with if the gut's not working properly and you're, you, you've got issues related to the absorption of nutrients and inflammatory markers, then the brain is sort of in this constantly inflamed state, what you'll see. Uh, you'll see uh, in particular issues with different aspects of the brain that can become inflamed. A good example is in the hypothalamus, there is a key area called the archaic nucleus, and there's these things called the goody-related proteins in there. And when the hypothalamus gets inflamed in that area, um, then you'll see outcomes like um, dysregulation of eating patterns and you know you just can't stop eating and all that and it has to do with inflammation in the brain mm. specifically so those things can be affected by diet um, dramatically yeah. um, so it, it's a complex question the just can't stop eating thing is fascinating because quite often going back to the gut there uh, one of the reasons that we crave a particular type of food a lot of it has to do with the bugs that are in the gut right 100%. let's yeah. talk about that yeah it's fascinating um and so i i get into this thing in the book that um I, you know again i hope i made the case for this <laughs> and it's that um your cravings are highly steerable mm -hmm. like like your cravings are not even you you think it's you, but it's really them. They've hijacked you and they want you to feed them what they want. 100%. So what you see a lot of is people who like, you know, like common, common thing when you deal with dietetics is, is like, oh, I just have these carb cravings in the evening and I can't shut them off. And it's like, you don't have carb cravings in the evening. They do. And they want you to feed them and they've hijacked your, your vagus nerve and your machinery and they're getting you to feed them. So when you go to sleep, they can multiply. Mm -hmm. The coolest thing about all this is how rapidly steerable all this is. Like I've seen out there, you know, like entire courses dedicated to crushing cravings and all trying to push them aside. There's hundred percent no need to do that. You can steer your cravings. You can make yourself crave whatever you want to crave just by building that bacteria up in the gut. And I've done it many, many times. I've done it with lots of people. So instead of cra craving cheesecake, you <clears throat> could crave fruits. Hundred okay. percent. I, I just did that one. Um, I've got I've got a client who um, uh, suddenly was just couldn't get enough fruit, couldn't get enough blackberries, couldn't get enough raspberries. And um, this where this gets really interesting is when you look at pregnancy and transgenerational epigenetics. If you're eating the right things during pregnancy, you can make your kid be born craving those things. Wow. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Like you want you want to eat like a lot of spinach, right? and your kid will be born craving spinach, um, and it's it's super fascinating. Okay. Yeah, but but in the more immediate now, um, you can, gosh. Um, we did these engagements with hospitals a few years back, and we had all these medical professionals. We actually filmed these. Um, I think they're on our site. You can go see them. And the sites uh, Veep Nutrition. Veep Nutrition okay. Yeah, and you'll see their testimony of like, yeah, I, I don't crave those things anymore. I get nauseated when I eat them, and now I'm craving this. And it's all by just changing communities in the gut. In fact, what you'll see happen is once the gut communities have been changed, and then you eat that thing you used to crave, you'll get super nauseated typically. And the reason is that you're giving substrate to the old bad guys and you're getting a rebloom of them and you're getting a die off of some of the good guys and then the, the, in the die off their guts break open and they spill lipopolysaccharide into the gut and then that's causing nausea. It's the same thing that happens when a fever breaks 
And so you get real nauseated, feel sick, and you're like, I don't, I don't want that stuff anymore. Wow. And so, yeah, you can completely steer cravings, and you can do it fast, very fast. I, uh, I went on a vacation a little while back, and um, I kept doing the red phenols on the vacation because I just, we were just, you know, literally eating on the road, like 7-Eleven, you know, every 10 miles. Whatever. And um, what I found at the end of it was I came back just craving, like, fibers and, and, and just because I had so much red phenols.